I never got into playing video games, but I was part of the first generation for whom video games were a really big deal. And I remember at elementary school, the kids that were older than us, like my friend's older brothers, would play Atari. Mm -hmm. And that takes you back, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Or they would play coin-operated video games at the arcade. Yes, yes. Those are ancient. My first experience was actually with Atari's first game that they allowed to be in homes was Pong. And so granted, that was a long time ago. We've seen a huge shift in realistic applications of graphics and gaming. But as a teacher, I think about video games a little differently. And currently, which is kind of exciting because I do have a personal connection, my students are actually studying physics and the physics that are involved with games like Angry Birds and why we need to consider literacy tools for potential game designers. And so I also think about this idea called gamification. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have the conversation about the future of words. This might be a new word for folks. Basically means the process of taking something that already exists, like a website, an enterprise, a business, even a classroom, and integrating the game mechanics into it to motivate participation, engagement, and loyalty. Well, who doesn't like immediate gratification yes. that gamification provides and the reinforcement of the tasks that you just completed? Many of the gamification principles come from video games, and they're very popular. In fact, stocks for two popular video game makers, Activision Blizzard and Take-Two Interactive Software, are up 250 to 600%. In 2018, 66% of the U.S. population over age 12 considered themselves gamers. That's up from 58% in 2013, according to Nielsen. Well, apparently, I am definitely in the wrong business if I'm not in part of that 250 to 600% increase in sales. I should probably... Oh, in think. stock value? Yes, yeah, you yeah. need to talk well, to your <laughs> yeah. retirement person. That's right. Well, last year, Blizzard's international tournament in Hong Kong drew the world's attention when a leading player who goes by Blitzchung received a serious punishment for using that platform to take a stand for Hong Kong protesters. And so it, video games do have a major effect on... Things outside the console. Oh, yeah. So to talk about stories about video games and how they develop and what they can inspire, we've invited an internationally competitive gaming team and a game developer and author, John Stotts, Casey Chambers, and Torin Wright. Welcome, guys. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. John Stotts built 90% of the World of Warcraft's caves, crypts, dens, mines, and hive tunnels. He also designed and built half of vanilla World of Warcraft's dungeons and spent 10 years on the project. In August 2019, World of Warcraft Classic by Blizzard Entertainment became the first title to be re-released for an entirely new generation to enjoy. WoW, which is World of Warcraft, is the first game in history to do this, and it's probably because the game is a worldwide phenomenon. John Stats, the game's first 3D level designer, is in a unique position to tell the story. And so after joining Blizzard, John was shocked to discover how many misconceptions he had about the gaming industry and wrote the WoW Diary to bridge that gap and between gaming fans and studios. So, John, tell us what's going on these days. Hi, Amy. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's good to talk to you guys. I am currently not a game developer anymore. <laughs> yeah, I've been there and I've done that, but I have uh, kept the memory alive. I have written a book about my experience on the development team. And it's from notes that I took every month for four years while I made World of Warcraft. It wow. was just a passion of just knowing. I wanted to know about the industry and how everything moved because I've I never worked with an animator before or, or a programmer before. So I wanted to know all the ins and outs about it. So I basically took those notes and wrote a very, very uh, in-depth book about it. But you're writing some other kind of books. Tell us about those too. Right now, I have moved from video games to board games. There's a, a board game <laughs> revolution in America going on right now. And I am developing companion books for the game that I'm developing. I call them RPG fiction books, which is role-playing game fiction. 
where the entire story takes place inside the game. Uh, all Everything is quantified. You, you mentioned gamification. And the interesting thing about this genre is that it really, you can describe things in precise quantities the way games do. And it paints a more vivid picture, I think, of a lot more uh, like action scenes. Mm. So I'm just in love with this genre right now. And so I've embarked on my own uh, little series. I love that. As a literacy teacher, that just makes my heart pretty happy. Because I'm, I'm sure my, my students would be very engaged with that. Absolutely. Oh, you know, bef- before we pressed record, we were saying that video games were going to be the very first episode of the very first season of our podcast. But in fact, board games were the very first episode of the very first season. So we did learn a little bit about um, how board games work and about what you what you said was the, that kind of revolution of interest um, right. in board games. Yeah. So exciting. Thank you, John. Oh, sure. Our other guests are Casey Chambers and Torin Wright. They are players for Heartbreak Esports and American University students, both majoring in international relations. Casey and Torin received international attention when they were banned by Blizzard for holding up a sign that read, Free Hong Kong Boycott Blizz, while participating in an official competition stream. The incident drew attention from publications around the world, including the Washington Post, Business Insider, The Verge, and CNN. Casey and Torin, tell us a little more about yourselves. Yeah, so we are receivers of the benefits of timing. Hmm. Uh, Our match was the first uh, televised Hearthstone competition after uh, Blitzchung's ban was announced. Hmm. And we had the ability to hold up that sign during our match to express really an entire community sentiment. And we were able to share that message with people watching the stream. And then in the wake of the decision and subsequent <clears throat> decisions uh, after, to continue to carry that message to more traditional media sources, as well as going all the way to Anaheim, to BlizzCon, to protest outside the convention. To give a little more background from us, like we're both from the Bay Area, but actually we met in college and through running actually i just went on a run so i'm actually freezing because it's like 40 degrees here i'm not used to this weather but I, at least i got into gaming way back when minecraft was pretty popular among like middle schoolers it's still like popular my- is this is this torrent speaking yeah all right so Torin, it, it is still popular i'm just gonna let you know that right now i i teach middle um, sc- i teach middle school students yeah yeah or like um I, I mean, my younger brother plays it. I guess <laughs> I know it's very popular. I just misconstrued my words. That's kind of like what brought me into the world. And then I started playing like uh, RuneScape. I never played World of Warcraft, but I've had many friends who have and are really big into it. I mean, it's a really cool game. But to get on the topic of like the board games, I, I've just recently gone into chess. So I kind of can see this like wave of board games kind of sweeping Again, the U.S., like 10 of my friends play chess now, and I, it might just be like a little niche thing at our school, but like we've all like gotten really into it. Like it's kind of like a competition of who's the best among the friend groups now, and we're all pretty bad. We've been studying like openings and middle game and end game and watching videos and stuff and reading about different plays. But it's yeah, it's really cool to know that like board games are coming back into uh, the scene because I still play a lot with my family. I have three younger siblings, and uh, it's like a, a thing we do. Like whenever I come back to California, of course, it's something that we do like every Friday night. That's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that, Tarn and Casey. And you know, it is very interesting. You know, a lot of people are gamers, and and you know, tonight um, our our episode is on video games, um, and they may not commit the way that maybe the three of you do. And so, John, first of all, how did you get involved in gaming? It's kind of funny. I've always been more on the art side of things. I, I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was in junior high school and high school and when i went to college i went fully into art and i continued on that path until i discovered 
that I could actually build my own 3D levels. Hmm. And it just, it was just kind of like the idea of walking through architecture that like I've imagined when I was in (laughs) grade school. It it just, it struck me as an interesting uh, hobby and I pursued it and I really pursued it. I would work crazy hours, like 80, 100 hour weeks on these, these 3D levels. And after four years of that, I had a portfolio that I, switched i went from advertising into game development just completely you know blizzard was my first gig in the industry so wow. that was just yeah there's Talk tutorials and how to like edit other games online and i just self-taught Wow. Talk about timing. That was great. <laughs> Good for <Yeah>. you. <laughs> how about you, Casey? I originally got into gaming through Hearthstone. It was for a long time, the only card game I played. And it was given to me and, and shown to me by my friends on the cross-country team. So I guess it, it flows through cross-country running circles. <laughs> and I just kept competing, and I got pretty good at it. And I started getting into tournaments, uh, leagues, and that brought me to college where I was able to form the club team where I competed in TESPA. And it was just non-stop commitment, dedication, the grind, and that eventually led to, to where we ended up and transitioning into a, a very different way to be active in gaming, but one that I'm, I'm proud that we were able to take. Yeah, I, that's awesome. How about you, Torin? Yeah, like I said, uh, I got uh, started with like Minecraft. Uh, I guess with Hearthstone, I think it was sophomore year, a couple of my friends were playing it, and I was like, oh, what's this card game? Because I used to play, like, uh, Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was, like, really, really young. So I, I was always kind of into, like, the card game kind of scene. But, yeah, like, that's sort of how, like, I started out with games. And I've kind of stuck with it ever since. Awesome. Thank you. Gaming is a lot bigger than some of the things you're describing from the past. In fact, the the research that we did for this episode says the value of the esports industry is nearly a billion dollars, and that's expected to double by 2022. That's just two years away. And large universities, I know the University of Texas at Austin, for one, now offer esports teams. They offer competitions and boot camps. I think it's even been on ESPN and it's becoming a lot more mainstream. What do you think is the future of video games, Casey? I, I think it will continue to grow. Um, the space will get larger and more integrated into the mainstream. I've heard rumors that League of Legends, which is a, a different esport, could potentially be coming to the main ESPN channel in the next several years. And with greater integration into just the larger world as a whole, Obviously, you see that in in mainstream media spaces. You see it in our space where politics and gaming collided. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll continue to grow. I can personally tell you that I had offers of honestly large scholarships to universities. And if pursuing international studies wasn't my North Star, I I probably would have accepted those offers. Mm -hmm. I think it'll continue to grow in colleges, in the professional space, and just in the mainstream media. Wow. Yeah. John, what do you think? I think what we'll probably do is follow China (laughs) the way we've always been. China's like 20 years ahead of us. It's kind of funny. Every 10 years, the economics model for games, whether it's buying boxes off the shelf or downloading games or just playing them for free. It keeps changing over and over. And it's every step is from cribbed notes from, from the Chinese. They are so far ahead of us. I've, I've, I've talked to a, no, a number of gaming executives from top Chinese companies, and they're so much smarter than the American executives in our industries. It's, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, but I think, yeah, we'll, we'll, we, it'll continue to grow. Uh, it, I don't think the sports comparison is quite accurate, which is fine because there's plenty of space for entertainment. The problem with games is that they're transitory. Legal Legends will come in and out and, you know, all the other games. will. you know, Fortnite is basically I'm surprised it's only a billion. Uh, Fortnite's got to be <laughs> bigger than that. But uh, the, the uh, Fortnite will come and go. 
And that's not true with like baseball and basketball. So it'll be interesting. I think it'll find its own niche though. And I think it might even be, even though they are as transitory, I think they'll actually, uh, uh, continue to grow. And that's yeah, like the channels that you're talking about, uh, South Korea had multiple TV channels like ESPN, just dedicated to Starcraft alone, just one game. So there's so much room to grow, I think. So I think, you guys are correct. It's it's going to keep keep going. Well, you know, this is something that's interesting to me. I what well, my my entire gaming experience probably was Mario Brothers or something. I mean, I don't <laughs> I don't I don't know anything about this. But my son was really into gaming, and a couple of years ago, he started this YouTube channel. And I said, "What is your YouTube channel?" Well, it's people watching me game on uh, what what yeah. was it? What was it? He played Red Dead Redemption or something like that. And uh, I said, "How many people could be interested in this?" He had five freaking thousand subscribers watching him play on YouTube. I mean, we'd kill for five thousand subscribers to this <laughs> podcast where we talk about yeah. like valuable things. <laughs> what I don't understand, I do not understand that. I do not understand gaming culture. What what is that, Torin? many different things i wanted to kind of point back to kind of like um the how how gaming was like growing Mm -hmm. because something my friend said the other day was that in each kind of country or i said region like there's different kind of popularity among like different sorts of games and i would i don't know like maybe correct me if i'm wrong but this this is kind of like my feeling or take on this but like the u.s kind of has more popularity with like because of kind of like how our culture is like uh, more FPS type games versus where the Eastern like Korea is very like strategic type games like Starcraft and like League of Legends. Right. You can kind of see this with like professional gameplay where you'll see like that's where more people like will come from, but also kind of to get back to your like question, like you'll have like different branches of like types of games. And with those kind of cultures, you'll have either like, Say for like League of Legends, you'll have people watching um, on Twitch, the like streamers like Pokemon and Cutie Pie, right? Whether it be for like comedic value or like um, just kind of like to learn the game. And then you have like uh, other stuff like on YouTube, more I'd say like it's like a cool way to kind of connect with someone that like you can feel like you're you can learn something or like it's kind of like enjoyment or like entertainment value. That's interesting. That's interesting, Tarn. It's, it sounds like you're explaining that within each country, there's a culture, a subculture within the gaming culture. So it's like well, the the culture has its own culture. Yeah, I, I'd say that. Yeah, but obviously, like this is just me, this kind of like seeing like professional gameplay and like friends from other places. I've never been to Korea or China or uh, Japan. So the only the only two like. Places I really like have like I guess more first person view would be uh, Europe, but more specifically like Italy, and then the U.S. And even in the U.S., I'd say there's different cultures and subcultures because it's so big. It makes sense. I, yeah. I had I hadn't thought about it no. in that way. John, what would you say? You guys, yeah, he, he, you're right on the money. It's there's so many subcultures out there. My friends would even joke that they don't even play games anymore. They watch other people play games and it's, it's easier. The, the, the on-ramp to some of these games, they're so complicated. League of Legends is a perfect example. It's a difficult game to play, to learn how to play. And it's actually just easier to, to watch and present it in the esports format. It's more entertaining. There are popular podcasts that they play Dungeons and Dragons and that's the podcast. And <laughs> there are a group there are groups of comedians that instead of just playing Dungeons and Dragons, what they'll do is they'll write their own script and it's half improv, half scripted. And instead of standing around in a kitchen like you would see on Seinfeld or one of you know sure. a, a, another comedian you know, comedy that we'd see on television, they're standing around in a dungeon with, you know, monsters running around. And that's just, it's 
there, there's so many ways that you can go with it. So sure. yeah, there's, there's so many subcultures out there. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, goodness, the Netflix phenom, Stranger Things, I mean, that most of that was set up about these boys playing Dungeons and Dragons in the one kid's basement. And if you don't understand that culture, it's, ha- it's a little bit tricky to maybe understand all of the context of of a show or a story. So right. I think as with any culture, you need to understand context to help you play the game. And I guess those podcasts and YouTube channels. It's going to be our next podcast. <laughs> help you understand. We'll do this one about like important things. And the next one is going to be us playing chess. There you go. Back there and you forth. go. Uh, well, let me ask you guys this question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happens when video games are bad, are not fun. John, what happens? What happens in that world? Well, it depends on the developer. Uh, In the 1990s, way back when, they would release the game anyway. And that you would play it and it would stink and you'd lose $50. Uh, Today, the games are bigger. the, The investments are much bigger. And the stakes are higher. Uh, it's no fun laying off employees. So they kill the game internally. That's kind of Blizzard's. The thing that separates Blizzard from other companies is they self-publish their games. And so they're not contracted with a publisher to release a, a game that doesn't work. So uh, many titles will be produced internally and they'll test it a little bit. Uh, it takes quite a bit of effort just to test a game. So if you get to the point where you can test it and it's not fun and you can't rework it, then you just kill it internally. Okay. So it's, yeah, that that's pretty much what, and you know, you could also just release it anyway, you know, <laughs> <laughs> see what you could get. Yeah. What about you, Casey? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, a game can just die on, on release. Yeah. Uh, an example of that would be Anthem. All I know about it was that it was a first-person shooter, and no one liked it. And the reason <laughs> I don't know anything else about it is that's basically what happened. Okay. Interesting. Because you mentioned, you know, with League of Legends, it, it is complicated. So you have to have a, a tutor almost in order to, to get through some of the complication. And I understand with video games, there has to be a balance between frustration and then that disorientation where you just want to give up. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, for me, learning Hearthstone was definitely a, pro- uh, a, a process. I, uh, we we had an interview in in Vice in the in the early days of October, and uh, I, I pointed out that I played like fifteen thousand games, and probably ten thousand of those were not quality at all because I was just learning. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, John. What is one key thing we need to know to understand the role of storytelling in video games? This is a good question, and this kind of dovetails into one of the misconceptions that I uh, debunked in my book. Uh, Surprisingly, um, you work with what art assets and what features you have with you. The, The cheapest thing to change is the story. Believe it or not, the story hmm. is the thing. It's the cheapest thing to change. If you can't build and animate a dragon, then suddenly your story will not have a dragon in it. It's, <laughs> That's it's, true. It's kind of funny how economics directs everything. <laughs> Honestly, I, I wrote even a, a chapter behind uh, because a lot of people who want to get into games, they want to get into storytelling in, in, in games. And it's really the smallest thing that happens at the end you know you, you you shoot for the moon and then you just cut 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 things away as you develop the game as you're making the game as you're programming the game as you're making art you realize oh we can't say that oh that's gonna go away oh this works better over here and that's really how <laughs> the stories get made it's it, it, and honestly it's not a very good palette uh, uh for storytelling because you're concentrating on the conversations with your friends you've got user interface elements you're dealing with you've got uh goals you've got all kinds of things coming at your audience and the subtleties that you enjoy from a book or a movie 
those are lost on the audience. So you kind of have to wield a blunt instrument when you're telling a story in a computer game. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. So. Okay. What do you think, Casey? So we have a very different uh, perspective, of course. Okay. We honestly don't have any experience behind the development or creation of a game. But we were definitely able to use Hearthstone, use the, the sign we held up in Tespa to tell a story and to create an audience for that story that both uh, listened and rebroadcast it to other people to spread it into a mass message. And one of the things that was most striking to me was that in the 24 or 48 hours after we held up our, our sign on the, during the match was that the root cause of what happened was not three American University Hearthstone players holding up a sign that said Blizzard did bad. What happened was that the community already had that opinion and that that was able to spread, manifest, and become a, a force for change and movement in a way that we were just able to harness. And the interaction between the community sentiment and the uh, chosen people who get to who get to craft that message, be it game developers, uh, executives at companies that make games, or even us that just had the support of the community. At the very core root of it, power comes from the people, and that was most most striking to me. All right, I like that. So, using story to validate and give uh, voice to, uh, that change to the narrative. Uh, I appreciate that. John, tell us about WoW Diaries. Uh, the World of Warcraft Diary is the result of me working <laughs> for four years compiling notes on how to make a big triple A game. I don't think a lot of people could actually write this type of book unless they took that many notes. I'll never be able to write a sequel because I stopped taking notes. A lot of people have asked me, but uh, yeah, it's it it is basically a fly on the wall perspective on how to make a game uh, the, the the debates that we had the, the the morale problems that the team faces the challenges and the surprises and the changes of directions you really see how the sausages are made and it's it's a surprisingly messy process so i wrote the book and I'm pub it's published and you can get it on amazon.com awesome and it's called the world of warcraft diaries yes Tor and Casey, do you have a book? A shameless plug? Uh, we don't have a book, but I do just want to share a thought, if that's all right. Absolutely. Us three have been able to share our message through, to the world, to be able to travel to Anaheim and share our faces publicly. And that was something that we were proud and happy to do. But there are other people who have not been given the opportunity to do so i met people in anaheim who came out to protest who were willing to talk to the media and give their their viewpoints but couldn't show their faces or couldn't say their names i don't even know their names mm. because of the the reach that china had into the united states and there's there's absolutely a cost of when authoritarian governments have that power. And it's unfortunate that the censorship happens at large media organizations that you wouldn't expect. Um, to people who I know, it's happened to us. And it's honestly sad and kind of shameful that journalists are trying to get these stories out there and higher up executives have stopped them. And sure. quite honestly, it's pathetic because we should live in a free country. Mm -hmm. And I certainly haven't given up that that thought, but it has been enlightening and saddening to see just the way the world works. Well, good for you. We appreciate your activism. That's awesome. You, you took enough notes there to <laughs> you, you got a takeaway somewhere. So I want to just share a couple of thoughts uh, with this episode that we've had with these wonderful guests, John Stotts, Tarn Wright and Casey Chambers. And it sounds to me that the whole concept of video games 
does have a narrative. It has a story, whether it's uh, the story behind how it was created, as John Stott shared, or what the story becomes when groups of people get together to play these games. And so we're just very thankful to have you all here at the table with us. And please join us next week as we continue to talk with the World of Warcraft developer, John Stotts, and competitive gamer and apparently troublemakers, Torrin Wright and Casey Chambers, about the stories video games tell and inspire. And while you wait... Please leave us a review, rate us on iTunes, and become a subscriber to the AfterwardPodcast.com. It does help us keep the conversation going. And as always, remember, you are welcome at our table.